what we're going to be doing, especially in this very first message of this series, is we're going to be attacking shallowness. Uh, we're, we're going to be attacking, as it pertains to the Christian life, head on, we're going to be attacking shallowness or superficiality or whatever you want to refer to it. Now, we can chuckle at a video like the videos you just now saw, but when it comes to how you and I are living our Christian lives, we better not settle for shallowness, and that'll become apparent why that is. We need to go deeper than that, and so that's what this whole series is going to be about. Now, have you ever noticed how common it is for people to measure success based on the size of a crowd? In a lot of different arenas of life, this is one of the key measuring sticks to gauge whether or not something, an event or whatever, has been successful. For example, when you think of sports, especially professional sporting events, it's the size of the crowd as much as anything that determines whether they're being successful. You think back just a few years ago, Carl Peterson was the general manager of the Kansas City Chiefs, and I can't really remember for sure how long that was. It was it 12 years or maybe 14 years, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. He was the general manager. They never made it to a Super Bowl the entire time. They never won the AFC. Um, they did win a few playoff games, but really not very many. Their playoff record was actually a losing record. But when it comes to their regular season record, man, they were great. I, they, they, were, they were in the playoffs almost every single year, usually winning the division. If not, they got a wild card slot in the, uh, the playoffs. Uh, but, but they had a great record. And really where it comes down to were they successful or not, it comes down to this one particular thing that made the Kansas City Chiefs stand out, head and shoulders taller than most any other uh, professional football team in the country. And that is that game after game after game, year after year after year, they had sold out Arrowhead Stadium. I mean, huge crowds. First of all, the seating capacity was bigger than most teams, what they have in their stadiums, and they were selling out every single time. They had the highest percentage of return season ticket holders, you know, than any other franchise, you know, had. And, and so based on that, even though they never did make it to a Super Bowl during all of those years, yet they were considered to be a highly successful team, and if for no other reason than the fact that the crowds just, you know, were surpassing what any other team was able to do during that same era. Or consider this. Later this week, this next weekend, we have Old Shawnee Days. You know, every year, either the first weekend or the second weekend of May, is when Old Shawnee Days takes place. And, you know, they'll have some games, rides, and stuff like that, some vendors down at Old Shawnee Town. They'll have the parade that uh, uh, Brad made an announcement about earlier on Saturday morning. And, and when the people that serve on the committee the planning committee for Old Shawnee Days, when they meet following this year's Old Shawnee Days, what are they going to use to gauge whether or not it was a success this year? It's going to be the crowd again. I mean, that's the number one thing they're going to be looking at. How many people turned out to the vendors? How many came to the parade and stuff like that? All right. Well, for those of you that live a little further south, Lenexa, at the very last weekend of this month, there is the Great Lenexa Barbecue Battle that's going on. I don't know how many years that has been going on. Same thing is true with that. When that whole thing shakes out and it's all said and done and the people start talking about, okay, what are we going to do next year or how many years are we going to lock in to doing this, a lot of those kinds of decisions are going to be determined based on the crowd that was drawn. You see, that's why I say success is often measured by the size of the crowd. Recently, Oceans of Fun and Worlds of Fun, they have opened up. Whether or not this season is going to be a success is going to be based on ticket sales. You know, we got Schlitterbahn just up north of us here. And if you've driven up on 435, which probably most everyone in here has, you've seen that big tower of a slide, 17 stories tall that they built. Now, that hasn't officially been opened yet, that part of it, but uh, it's supposed to be a little bit later this week. 
The curious thing, I just heard this last week, that they didn't actually construct that brand new. They bought it from someplace out on the West Coast that it failed. It broke down a few times, and so they sold it. And so, now I'm not sure what to think about that. There's something a little odd about the sound of that. But uh, what is the reason for getting a 17-story slide constructed? Bottom line, ticket sales. It's the crowd. They're hoping just to draw that many more people. I say all that to say this. Pretty much the same thing happens in the average church. The average church in our country, that they will gauge whether or not they're being successful as a church in doing what they should be doing based on the crowds, based on the numbers, by evaluating what average attendance is and some of that. Well, having said that, I want to show you something that I find interesting when I open up the Bible and I read about the life of Jesus. It's a passage of Scripture that starts in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, and it starts off with these words. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. You see, he was bringing in lots of people. This was during that period of time that we referred to as his days of popularity. There were big crowds. They wanted to come. They wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to see the miracles he was performing and all of that. Now imagine how the disciples felt while all this was playing out. I mean, they were probably giddy with excitement because there were such big crowds. And they were saying to one another, we're on the ground floor of this thing. We were among the first they became followers of his. And now, look, you can't, can't even keep track of how many people there are. From other passages of Scripture, we know that there were other religious leaders who were jealous because of the fact that Jesus was drawing large crowds. In fact, that's what was fueling a lot of the opposition from, from uh, some of the Pharisees and, and the priests and teachers of the law and, and, and all is be, because they were jealous of the fact that more and more people were going to Jesus and not coming to them. If Jesus, back at that time, had a Facebook page, imagine all the likes he'd have. Every time he'd post something, everybody would be liking it. You know, I mean, he would have been really popular there as well because he was, for all intents and purposes, he was riding the crest of the wave. Large crowds gathering around. But when you keep reading that passage, and I've just given you the first what, six words of that verse. When you keep reading that particular passage, you see something that you weren't expecting to see. So let me go ahead and show you what ends up happening here. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And it's just like, whoa, what was that, Jesus? I mean, I can see some of the disciples right now kind of scrambling like, whoa, wait a minute, did the teleprompter break down? What's going on here? He's just kind of throwing stuff out there. I don't remember clearing that. Did you look over his notes before he started talking? You know, I can just see the disciples just kind of getting a little bit, a little bit concerned here because uh, this is going to run some people away, talking harsh talk like that. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, obviously, that's a hyperbole because Jesus never taught that we were to hate people. But yet what he is saying is that our love for him should be so intense that anything compared to it is a distant second. I mean, I think that's the whole point that Jesus is making here. And still, that would be something that, uh, uh, that would be troubling to some people, perhaps even offensive to some people. And then he said, and anyone who, want, who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, I've already noticed this morning in greeting several of you that we have several of you that have carried a cross here today. I saw two or three or so cross necklaces, and someone had some cross earrings. And, and uh, you know, we've got these different kind of cross. Some people get cross tattoos. and so, Well, that's not what this is talking about. Back in that day and time, whenever the subject of the cross came up, there was only one thing people thought of, and that was the fact that it was an instrument of death. 
It was something very ugly that the Roman Empire had introduced into their entire domain, and that included Israel. And so when Jesus is saying anyone who does not carry his cross, everyone knows what that means. That means you need to die to yourself. You need to be willing to die. You know, otherwise you can't be my disciple. This was pretty strong stuff that Jesus was throwing out there. Do you, do, you realize, do you think that Jesus realized that talk like that might thin the crowd a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I think so. In fact, even if you follow it a little further, and I don't have a slide for this, but Luke chapter 14, starting verse 28, it says, Now great crowd, or verse 28, For which of you, wanting to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost? to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to make fun of him, saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Now, Jesus isn't trying to give them counsel about how you build a tower. It was fairly common for people that had vineyards to build some sort of a tower to be able to keep an eye on your entire vineyard just to make sure nothing bad was happening to it. But that's really not what Jesus is doing, is counseling people as to how to approach building a tower in their vineyard. Rather, instead, the whole point that Jesus is trying to get across is that he does not want any halfway Christians. He doesn't want people to be halfway with him. And that's why he's saying you need to count the cost. You need to think this down. You need to hate your, your brothers and sisters, your mother and father. You need to pick up your cross and follow me. You don't start building a tower unless you've thought it through. Are you really up to seeing this thing all the way through? And what he was talking about was being a follower of his. He says, I really want you to think this through because I don't want half-hearted followers. I don't want people that are just mediocre in their Christianity, just kind of so-so. That's ultimately what he was trying to get across to them. Did it thin the ranks some when he said this? Did the large crowds become not such large crowds? Yes. Now, in this particular passage, we don't have a specific verse that states that, but we can look at other passages where something similar was playing out, like in John chapter 6, verse 66, and it says there, from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Yes, it thinned the crowds. Because some people, you know, they're just like, oh, man, this is too much for me. I'm, I'm not all in like that, not to that degree. You see, what Jesus was trying to get across to people, and this is one of those passages, Luke 14, where he's really trying to drive it home. It was during some of the time or the ending of the time of his days of popularity, is that what he was looking for was total devotion. He was looking for total surrender to him. He was looking for total commitment. And he didn't want to settle for anything short of that. Jesus, we all know, taught in parables. A lot of his teachings came in the form of a parable. The two shortest parables of all probably have the clearest message of all of his parables. In fact, just in one shot of the screen, I have in the entirety two parables. These are very short parables. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, one verse tells one parable. It says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. There you go. That's the sum total of one of Jesus' parables. What was the point that he was trying to get across? He was talking about you need to be all in. This is what, you know, that that God is looking for people that are going to be all in as far as the kingdom of heaven is concerned. Now, buried treasure in a field was not something that was unheard of back in that day. They didn't have safe deposit boxes. They didn't have banks on every street corner, kind of like what we do around here. And and you can put your valuables in, you know, places like that. They, They didn't have that sort of thing. And the land, you know, when you thumb through the Old Testament, I mean, it was frequently overrun one people coming in and conquering another, different battles, even the Assyrians, the Babylonians, stuff like that, the Midianites, stuff like that that was playing out. And so whenever there was a threat like something like that looming on the horizon, they didn't just leave their valuables in their house because that was the first place that would be checked. Rather, instead, they would find some hole in the ground or they would create a hole in the ground or they would find a cave 
and they would hide away their stuff. Now, what presented the problem here was that sometimes they were deported into captivity, like with the Assyrians or the Babylonians. But also what very well may have happened is, is that they may have been killed in a battle that had played out, and they hadn't told anyone else where they had hidden their valuables. And so it was something that wasn't unheard of to have buried treasure. You know, who knows where? But, I mean, it, was, it, could, it could potentially be anywhere. And so for someone to stumble upon buried treasure was not something that was unheard of back in that day. And what Jesus is saying is he's taking a little slice of real life and he's saying, well, this is kind of what the kingdom of heaven is like when someone stumbled upon some buried treasure. They go and they sell everything that's un- they got a title to it that's under their name. They sell it all off in order that they can buy that one piece of land. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like, all in. And then he tells the second parable. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. It's a very similar story. The difference is, though, the first one is kind of someone stumbles upon it. The second one, they're actually searching for it. But both of them play out in a very similar fashion once they find it. You know, and, and, and there's definitely some correlation to our lives because when, when we consider all the people that are in this room here today, there is a combination of, of a couple of different crowds of people. There are some of you who at some point in time in your life, you began searching for truth. You were trying to find what is truth, what is purpose, and what, what should your direction in life be. And through that search, you came upon the gospel message and you embraced that message. But you were in a search mode, and that's what played into all of it. And then there were others of us that are in this room that we really weren't searching when we stumbled upon the gospel of Jesus. You know, we weren't really in a search mode. It was just kind of a happenstance thing. Though with God, there is no such thing as happenstance. God was playing into the equation, but we just kind of stumbled into it. And then we saw the gospel for what it was. It was just like, whoa, why didn't someone tell me about this? You know, and then we were all in on it. That's what the only difference is between those two parables. But both of them play out the same way. They involve people that are willing to give up absolutely everything in order to embrace the kingdom of heaven. All in. No no partially sort of a thing. Think of the time when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest command of all commands? I mean, we all know the answer to that question. We've heard it enough times. We've read it, and we've heard messages based on it. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus responded to that question by saying, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. There's the greatest commandment of all commands. We've heard it so many times, we fairly frequently take it for granted what it says. But I want you to notice something. Jesus did not say, that the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with most of your heart, most of your mind, most, hopefully 90% of your soul, most of your strength. Now, it was all. This is what God is looking for, 100%, as we say. He's looking for us to be all in, jumping in with both feet. Now, if I need to remind you, of what his feeling is of anything less than that, all we have to do is to pay a visit to the letter written to the church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, and basically, because of their so-so level of commitment, the lukewarm approach that they had kind of fallen into, Jesus made it very clear that makes him sick to his stomach. Okay, so, so the Bible's really clear on this, about how God feels about it. So in view of that, this whole series of messages is a challenge for all of us to go deeper. Let's not settle for kind of a superficial faith, a superficial approach to Christianity, kind of a surfacey sort of a thing. And all of that really begins with understanding what our passion is. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. What are you passionate about? Most of us are passionate about something. There is something somewhere in your life that is a significant driving force in your life. 
It might be cars. You know, we kind of had that as an analogy in our last message series. I had one fellow last Sunday as he was on his way out. He said, I want you to know, and he had been coming here for, for at least 10 years, if not longer. And, and uh, um, he said, I want you to know that in the 10 years I've been coming to this church, this is my favorite sermon series of all. <laughs> well, it's a little wonder why. He's passionate about cars. You know, so, so it was really striking a chord with him. And, and I can say, because I had even noticed, he, he was sitting up a little straighter. He was a little more attentive, you know, in the messages of that previous series. Some people are passionate about football or basketball. Some people are passionate about the grandkids. Now, if I had a dime for every time some grandmother in this church over the years has shown me a picture of their grandkids... In fact, I'd even be richer this morning because I had two or three showing me this morning. <laughs> but everybody's p passionate about something. Maybe it's about yard work. Just spending several hours in your yard. I still don't have that one figured out. I, I have a theory. I think they were probably dropped on their head as kids. But, you know, uh, some people are really passionate. On a day like yesterday, man, it's just like beautiful day. Spend three or four hours working in the yard. That kind of makes my stomach uneasy, but for other people, it makes them smile. Some people are passionate about traveling. And we've got some people in this church that love to travel. And uh, in fact, uh, they love to travel so much that sometimes before they're even done with one trip, they're already starting to plan their next trip because they look forward to it so much. You know, I, I have an opinion on all of this. I think that if a person is not passionate about something, then there probably is a greater chance that that person struggles to some degree with depression. I mean, that's just my own opinion, my own theory on it. But if you're not passionate about anything, then life is basically filled with routine. And that can get kind of boring. It's when you're passionate about something that that adds some flavor and excitement to life. So here's the question that I want you to wrestle with today in this first message of the series. How does your passion for, and you fill in the blank, your children, cars, whatever it is, how does your passion for whatever compare to your passion for the Lord? That's what I want you to examine, and I want you to answer in your heart of hearts today. How does your compassion, or your, compa your passion for one of these things compare to your passion for the Lord? And before I go any further, I want to give you a couple of possibilities as far as a memory verse is concerned. Uh, there was a couple of passages that I just couldn't decide which one to settle on, and I thought, you know, I'm going to throw them both out there and encourage you to take one of these passages and memorize it. And if this is a particular area that you're struggling in in your life, that you're not as passionate for the things of God as what you should be, then one good way of kind of getting the, the, the momentum moving in the direction you need to get it moving in is to memorize some of God's Word. And uh, these verses do a great job of expressing passion. Both of them come from the book of Psalms. Psalm 42 verses 1 and 2 says it like this, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When may I come to see God's face? Those words are just dripping with passion. I mean, the psalm writer that put that together, it's just, you, you can really tell what the heartbeat of his life is. As a deer longs for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, God. My soul thirsts for God. Yeah, those are passionate words. Here's another one, and we know who wrote this one. It was David. Psalm 27, verse 4 says this, One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. One thing, David says, one thing that, that I ask, that I seek beyond anything else is that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Yeah, th th there's passion being expressed. And what I want to encourage you to do is to take either one of those 
you know, make that commitment that you're going to memorize it this week and allow their words to become your words, to become an expression of your passion. So in the remainder of our time, what I want to do is I want to help you to evaluate just how passionate you are for God and for the things of God. Because it's real easy for me to stand up here and to be talking about how we need to have passion for the Lord. We need to be all in. God doesn't want any halfway Christians. It's easy for me to say this stuff and, and for you to, to hear this and say, oh yeah, I'm passionate for the Lord. And just kind of make a sweeping response like that. Yeah, I'm passionate for the Lord. But actually, what I want to encourage you to do is I want you to break it down and measure your passion a little bit and to be able to see more clearly whether indeed it is true you're passionate for the Lord or whether you're lacking as far as your passion is concerned. There are certain characteristics that practically always hold true when people are passionate about something. And on the back of your outline, I've got eight of those listed out. And that's what we're going to spend the remainder of our time on. When you are passionate about something, you tend to get excited about it. I don't think anyone in here can argue with that. We would all be in agreement. In fact, all eight of these are very common sense. After we go through it, you're just going to be like, well, duh, yeah. But it's good to be able to break it down and take a closer look at it and then to examine your heart in re regards to the kingdom of God. When a person is passionate about something, they tend to get excited about it. You've seen it happen. When you go up to someone and you start into a conversation with them and you ask them a question pertaining to something that they're passionate about, what happens? Their eyes light up, don't, don't they? I mean, you... you, you, you touch on a subject that someone is passionate about and man all of a sudden they've got energy and they start talking and sharing it with you now if you're if you come up and you approach a subject with someone and they have no passion on it they will be polite and respond and stuff like this but eventually what will end up happening is they'll start looking over your shoulder and they'll i mean you, you'll start losing their attention because whatever you're talking about is something that's not a passion of theirs. You think about, you think about uh, these guys that go to Arrowhead Stadium. And a lot of you have been out there before, so you know what I'm talking about. You've seen pictures of them up on the big jumbotrons and stuff like that. Once in a while, they'll show them on TV. But on the jumbotrons, they show them even more frequently when you're at a game. I'm talking about oversized guys. They take off their shirts, and they bear it all, you know, big bellies, and, and they, they've got war paint on their faces, maybe, and, and they've got big arrowhead painted on their chest, or maybe a C or an H or something spelling out, Chiefs, because they're with a couple of other guys that are doing the same thing. Now, what is it that possesses somebody, you know, a 55-year-old overweight man to go out into a public setting where there's 75,000 people and cameras all over the place televising what's happening to millions what possesses them to do something like that <laughs> okay all right yeah <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that does play into that some. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, I mean, they already painted their chest before they ever showed up to the game. And so alcohol was only added later. <laughs> they had already determined this is what they were going to do. They, they, they were enthused. They are excited about their team. Here's something that, uh, that you may or may not know. The word enthusiasm actually comes from two Greek words, in theos. The word enthusiasm, the background of that word, in God. And I find that very intriguing, very interesting. And we can be enthusiastic about tons of things. But when you break down the Greek and you see the word itself, the meaning of the word literally means in God. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 11 says, Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. So if you're passionate, your faith is something you get excited about. Another thing that happens if you're passionate is you tend to prioritize it, whatever it is you're passionate about. Now, whether that is your kids' Christmas program or your grandkids' program or whether that's a church motorcycle ride that is scheduled or whether it is a race that's coming up in a month or two up at the Kansas Speedway, uh, if it's something that you're passionate about, you're going to make sure it gets on your calendar and you're going to make time for it, even if you have to rearrange things that were already on your calendar. You know, you'll make a call or you'll scratch something off your calendar in order to fit this on there because you're passionate about it. You prioritize it. Jesus had said this in Matthew chapter 6. The thing you should want most is God's kingdom and doing what God wants. Then all these other things you need will be given to you. This should be the number one thing that you're wanting more than anything else. You see, it ought to be something that becomes the priority of your life. It is at the very top of the list. Another thing that happens if you're passionate about something is you tend to invest in it. Yeah, investing time, but also investing money. I mean, you, you stop and think about uh, um, those of you that are golfers. Um, if that's really a passion of yours, I would venture to guess that if that's been a passion that has been there for some time in your life, I would venture to guess that the golf clubs you're using aren't something that you bought at a garage sale 12 years ago. It's something you've invested in in getting what you really wanted, something that would improve your game and make it more enjoyable, and you were willing to shell out those extra dollars in order to do that. Or if your passion has to do with, with movies and that sort of thing, then then uh, um, you probably can't really settle for just waiting until Redbox has or Netflix or something like that. You want to see it on the big screen. Even if you go during matinee time, I don't think they discount popcorn and pop and stuff like that. So, you know, you're paying $5 or whatever at, at a matinee showing, but yet you're still shelling out 7 or $8 if you're getting some popcorn and pop. I mean, you're investing in it. Or if it's computers and the latest thing comes out on the market and, and it's just, i got to get that computer. I mean, how much did that new iPad cost that you just got that you probably really didn't need, but it was faster, it was better than what you had before, it was more convenient? If you're passionate about it, then that's probably something that you went that direction and you were willing to spend those extra dollars. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. Way back in the Old Testament, in Proverbs chapter 3, it says this, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first and best part of your income. Now, usually this verse, we've looked at it, this is the God's Word translation, we've looked at it from the NIV perspective, which it says, with the first fruits of your crops. But the reality of the matter is, there are very few of us in this room that are still farmers. Some of us maybe grew up on a farm, out in rural settings and all, but... Even that was enough years behind us that we don't always think that way anymore, not like we used to. And so what God's Word translation does, they break it down what the actual meaning is behind the words. And, and when it says, when the NIV says the first fruits of your crops, the basic idea there is with the first and the best part of your income. It's not leftovers. This is a verse of Scripture that makes it very clear that when we honor God with our giving, we don't pay all of our bills and do all this and that, and then if we have something left, then we give that to God. That is not honoring God with the best. Rather, instead, we start right off the top, God first. Then we start paying our bills and doing all of the other stuff. And that's actually what the passage of Scripture is teaching here. And it is a concept that um, is unsettling for a lot of people. But if a person is passionate in their faith, this goes hand in hand with what they want to do. This is what they're drawn to do, is to honor God in every aspect of their life, including this particular area of giving. 
Another thing that, that if people are passionate about something that they tend to do is they tend to learn about it. They will spend extra time learning more, looking at it from different perspectives and gaining additional insight. For example, if you're passionate about politics, then we will pray for you. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Now, if you're passionate about politics, then that's something that I would venture to guess that you spend a fair amount of time reading, listening to talk shows and the like, and trying to learn as much as you can as far as whatever bills are being presented before Congress or foreign affairs and all this kind of stuff. But you're up on all that, and you want to stay current with that. You continually are educating yourself. You're learning more and more about it. If you are passionate about computers, then that's the way you are about computers. You would be the kind of person that would read a, um, a, a com computer book you know, just to learn about, you know, what some of the latest and greatest things are that are coming out on the market, just right on the horizon, because that's something that interests you. Or if you're passionate about your lawn, then that's something that you know, you know, as far as when you're supposed to plant seed, when weed and feed, when you're supposed to, you know, what seasons you're supposed to do this stuff. Others of us, we have no clue. We look out there and we see everybody else's lawns growing, and it's like, wow, what happened to ours? You know, oh, well, you know, and we just go on. We have no passion about it, so we're not learning about it. But for people that are passionate about it, they're going to invest the time to learn, to expand their understanding. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. God's word. We don't settle for just a dab, just a little bit of it, but rather instead we want it to, to richly, abundantly dwell within us. And so I'll just say this about it, and this in helping you to evaluate your passion level for the Lord and the things of God is, is I'll say it like this. If you seldom, if ever, crack the cover of a Bible during a given week of your life, then that speaks volumes about what's happening in your heart as far as things with the Lord are concerned. If you hardly ever crack a cover, and I know some people say, well, I'm not very good reading. All right, well, we'll talk about, you know, CDs or whatever. If you hardly ever spend time internalizing God's Word, then that speaks volumes about what you're not passionate about, okay? If you're passionate about something, something else you tend to do is you tend to set goals regarding it. You know, we all do this sometimes without even realizing that we're doing it. Setting goals. If your passion is golf, then uh, when you go to the driving range, you probably have some goals to be able to, with consistency, hit it a little longer than what you normally hit it, or hit it a little straighter than what you normally hit it. And, and that's one of the goals that you're trying to accomplish. Or, or maybe it's just, you know, to lower your score, that this year with the different golf outing, outings that you're going to participate in, your average score, you want to see it just a little lower than what it was last year or the year before. Now, I'm not passionate about golf. I mean, I've only ever played a legitimate uh, nine holes of golf, if you don't count putt-putt, in my life, okay? That's it. And that was plenty. I had to borrow a golf ball to do that because I didn't own one. And when I was all done, I gave it back, and I had seven other ones. I was finding everybody's golf balls because for some reason I was going where the grass was tall and behind the trees and all of this kind of stuff because that first ball that someone had loaned me was faulty or something or other. It wasn't going straight. So, uh, so golf, yeah, that's, that's not something I'm passionate about. But, you know, you talk about motorcycle. You know, I told you, you know, here about, what was it, three years ago when Mike Stock and I, we did the Iron Butt Ride where, you know, it's 1,000 miles and 24 hours. And I thought, well, let's just notch that up a little more. Let's go 1,500 miles in 36 hours and, and uh, without any sleep or anything. And, and, man, that was just something that just causes your heart to beat faster. It does for us. You know, because that was, that was a goal we were setting because we were passionate about it. Another goal that I haven't spoken much of uh, in the past, but it's one that I've had for quite a long time, is that uh, I want to ride my bike, um, starting, not trailering it, starting from here in Shawnee to all 48 states, you know, in the continental U.S. I'm only two rides away from accomplishing that. 
And, uh, um, and by the end of this year, you know, I'll just have a trip to California I need to take, and then I'll have all 48 states. See, setting goals. That's what you do. When you're passionate about something, you set goals in regards to it. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 says, So our aim, you can insert the word goal because some translations do, uh, target, that's what some other translations say. So our aim is to please him always in everything we do, whether we are here in this body or away from this body and with him in heaven. Our goal is the same. Whether we're alive or we're dead, our goal is the same. Our goal is to be pleasing to God. That is what we're targeting in our life. If you're passionate about your faith, that is a goal. But you have other goals, you know, along the way you set, like reading through the Bible in a year. You know, you, you'll set a goal, you know, like that, or memorizing a certain number of verses of Scripture when you always thought you had a terrible memory and couldn't memorize, but yet you'll set that as a goal. You see, the, these are all goals that you're establishing because they help reinforce you in regards to your faith the passion that you have in getting closer and closer to God. If you are passionate about something, something else you tend to do is you tend to dwell on it. Yeah, what do you spend your time daydreaming about? You know, odds are, you know, if, if we take out the worrying part of what we dwell on, and I'm going to do a series on that here sometime in the future, because we really need to deal with that subject in a more in-depth way. But if you take out the anxiety, the worry part of what we dwell on, then your thoughts tend to gravitate toward what you're passionate about. That's what you spend your time dwelling on. Well, here's a great passage of Scripture, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. You have been raised to life with Christ, so set your hearts on things that are in heaven where Christ sits on his throne at the right side of God. Keep your minds fixed on things there, not on things on earth. This is what you dwell on. If you're really passionate about this, this is where you find your mind going. If you regularly go multiple days in a row without even the thought of God crossing your mind, that's pretty telling about what you're not passionate about. I mean, if you can go multiple days in a row without saying a prayer, without reflecting on a passage of Scripture, without thinking what would God want me to do in this given situation, if you can go multiple days in a row without those kinds of thoughts, then uh, I'd, I'd consider that to be a warning sign because, because that shows that there's not much passion there in your life. You will dwell on what you're passionate about. Here's something else that you will tend to do. You will tend to talk about it. What you're passionate about, you talk about. you got to be careful here because you know how this works is that you, you go up to somebody and you ask them a question about something they're passionate about. They will answer your question and they will answer 15 other questions you didn't ask them because they just love talking about it. This morning, I, I was greet, greeting some folks, and, and I was asked the question. It was like, hey, you got any motorcycle rides planned this year? You know, and I, I don't think he knew what he was getting in for on that. You know, it was like, man, I'm not greeting anyone else. This guy's talking about what I enjoy talking about. And so I was talk, talking about all the different trips and rides and stuff like this that our church group has planned and stuff like that. Well, see, that, that's, you know, and sometimes you're just like, oh, boy, you know, you're going in a lot more detail than what I wanted. Well, but that's what a person does. When they're passionate about something, they really enjoy talking about it. The very first date Colette and I went on was uh, um, in the fall semester of my junior year in high school, and uh, it was a Saturday, and we went to see um, the very first Star Wars movie that came out. And over in Topeka, it was sold out, so we had to go to Smokey and the Bandit instead. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's like, all right, whatever we're on show in about the same time. And, uh, and so next week we went to Star Wars. But then I took her to one of my favorite eating establishments, you know, in Topeka. I'm not really sure if they've got any of those over here. Have you ever heard of Burger King? And, uh, you know, I, I took her to Burger King, and we got our Whopper and fries, and we went and sat down in the booth. And I'm not sure how the conversation started, if she asked a question or it was right in the middle of football season, or if I started into it, but uh, we spent the entire meal talking about nothing except 
football. And I don't think she probably said two sentences the whole time. I was doing all the talking. You know, I mean, we were nervous. I know I was nervous and everything. And, and uh, so what do you resort to? You resort to what you're passionate about. And at that time, it was either talking about a GTO or football. And that was about it. You know, and uh, uh, why she ever agreed to go out on another date, I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, but she did. And so we eventually talked about some topic that interested her. Uh, but but that's, that's, <laughs> that's what we do. We talk about... We talk about what we're passionate about. Well, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 15, if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. And you know, that's something we really don't need our arm twisted if we're passionate about our faith because we look for opportunities to be able to share that. You know, and, and, and that's what God's will is, that, that we do that. Now we're ready for number eight. So, if you're passionate about something, you will tend to get excited about it. You will tend to prioritize it. You'll make time in your schedule for it. You will tend to invest in it. You will tend to learn more about it. If you're passionate about it, you will set goals in, regarding, in regards to it. You will spend time dwelling on it, and you will certainly talk about it any opportunity you get. And number eight, if you're passionate about something, you tend to hang out with those that share your passion. You know, just down the road here, we've got some ball fields. And I live out in West Shawnee, so I, I drive Johnson Drive heading west all the time. And, uh, and there's all those softball fields, a couple baseball fields, the girls' ball fields and all this stuff that are out there. And one of the things I've discovered over the years, and sometimes I'm driving home, here from the church late, late in the evening, and, and, and the games are pretty much over out there. But the thing that I'll discover is that when people get done with their game, they don't just immediately jump in their cars and trucks and drive home. They linger. They hang out in the parking lot. They visit. They're talking. They're leaning on the bed of a truck. They've got lawn chairs set up, and they're just out there shooting the breeze. And I don't know for sure what they're talking about, but the thing is that they share this passion in common, and they like to hang out with people that share those same kinds of things. Well, that goes a long way in explaining why times of fellowship and Bible study and stuff like that is stuff that we look forward to. I had someone this morning right before this service saying that you know you love your church when you're not here on a Sunday morning and you feel it, you notice it, you long for it, that you wish that you were here. You know, I, I think that's great. That was a great way of expressing what we're talking about here. Acts chapter 2, this is the day of Pente following the day of Pentecost. It says, day after day they met together in the temple, they broke bread together in different homes and shared their food happily and freely while praising God. They were hanging out with one another. They were regularly spending time with one another. It's kind of like the, the, the coals of a fire. You spread those coals out, and eventually they're going to grow cold. But if you pile them together, all the different embers and everything, you pile that together, and all of a sudden you'll get a glow because they're feeding off of one another. And that's the same way it works spiritually in our lives. So, in view of what we've talked about, how would you score yourself? on your passion for the Lord. Are these things that we've talked about, are, are these some of the characteristics that you see in your life pertaining to your walk with the Lord? I mean, is this verse, I mean, is it the heartbeat of your life? One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I mean, is that the heartbeat of your life? Are these the characteristics that you're feeling and experiencing? We live in a culture that oftentimes is marked by shallow Christianity. Some of Barna's research over the years has shown that uh, the number of Christians in this country still is up around 80% or, or above that number. But when more defining questions are asked, like, are you practicing your faith? All of a sudden, the numbers drop. 50% fall out. And the numbers go down to about 30%, 30, the low 30s. You know, as far as people that are really active in their faith, people that are passionate. So you remove the passion from the question, and all of a sudden, reality starts setting in. And, and you know, I, I hear that, and I read those kind of studies, 
And, and I recognize from what I see in the Bible, that never would sit well with Jesus. Whenever he picked up on shallowness within people, he challenged them to go deeper. He challenged them to be totally committed. He challenged them to be sold out for the cause. We're going to have our time of communion now, so our ushers are going to be preparing for that. And my, my thought leading into this meditative time, this prayer time, is really pretty basic. I want you to stop and think about all that Jesus has given to you. You think of what he has given. He's given his all to you. He left heaven, he came to earth, he gave his life here on earth, he suffered, he bled, he died for you. He gave his all for you. I want you to reflect on that. And then I want you to ask yourself one question and give the Lord an honest answer to this. What are you giving in return? He's given his all to you. What have you been giving in return? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word and how your word speaks to our hearts and at times even convicts us in ways like it has done here today. And I pray, Lord, that you would, through your spirit, would, would search our hearts and help us to examine them and to be able to see what you see. Father, thank you for loving us loving us more than we deserve. Your grace and your mercy. Father, I pray that in response, you see within our lives what needs to be happening there. I pray, Lord, that there's some passion that's kindled, that there's a desire to seek you and love you with all of our hearts, or all of our mind, soul, and strength. Father, help us never to settle for superficial Christianity, but rather instead, might you find us being all in 100%.